You might turn in your Bible to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. It's where we'll begin this morning. I was awakened about 2 o'clock this morning, and I was unable to go back to sleep. And so I was thinking about our gathering today and our assembly and our worship today. And I, I don't want my dad to feel like I'm picking on him because I'm not. I truly had this thought before he made this comment this morning. But my dad said something about the great crowd that we have today. And I've said that too. But as I got to thinking about that word, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a crowd that we should be thinking about, really. We're not spectators at a ball game, right? We're family. And so really the word that I think would be best is the word reunion. Every Lord's Day, we have a reunion, as it were. And isn't that a wonderful thing that we can do? And again, Dad, I'm not picking on you for using the word crowd. I've done that many times myself. But as I was thinking about, okay, Ben, don't get up and say, welcome to everyone. We have a great crowd today. Don't do that, Ben. I thought, well, what word would be better? Reunion. A beautiful word. We're glad to see all of you that are here this morning. Thank you for being a part of our crowd. I'm kidding. <laughs> this morning, we're talking about what happened when Christ died. Jesus' death and resurrection is the most extraordinary event in the history of the world. Whether you are a Christian or not, that is true. It is the most extraordinary event that has ever taken place. But for us as Christians, this is obviously true. Our entire worldview is based upon the fact that Jesus Christ died and he rose again. Everything that we believe is based upon this great climactic event. The purposes of God from all eternity all came to that moment on Calvary where God in the flesh gave up his life for the sins of the world and three days later he took it back again. There were miraculous events that happened when Jesus died. And this morning, as we talk about what happened when Christ died, it's those miraculous events surrounding his death that I want to talk about. But before we get into those, let's say that it shouldn't surprise us that there were miraculous events surrounding the death of Christ. There were also miraculous events surrounding his birth. At his birth, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, conceived John in her old age. Jesus' mother Mary conceived as a virgin. And there were other incredible events that took place surrounding his birth, such as angelic appearances and a dream of revelation for Joseph saying, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. But it wasn't just Jesus' birth that was surrounded by miraculous events. His entire life was surrounded by miracles. In fact, in John chapter 3, you remember Nicodemus who came to Jesus? In John 3 and verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know that God sent you because of the miracles that you are performing. In John chapter 21 and verse 25, the apostle says that if someone tried to catalog all of the miracles that Jesus had performed, that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. And of course, we understand that to be hyperbole. But John's point is that Jesus' life was filled with miraculous works that he did to prove that he was indeed the Son of God. Works that he did to heal and to cure disease and to fin finish hunger and, and, and thirst and wonderful things that Jesus did, all of which confirmed his identity as God's son. His birth, his life, and even his death surrounded by great miracles. Now let's go to Matthew 27. And put your marker there. Matthew 27 is going to be our main text for the day. 
We'll turn to other places, but we will come back to Matthew 27 again and again. So as we talk about what happened when Jesus died, there are four things that I want to call your attention to. Four things that Matthew's gospel calls our attention to. When Jesus died, first of all, darkness covered the land. This was an unusual darkness. This was not simple nightfall due to the time of day. But this was a supernatural kind of darkness. Look with me in Matthew chapter 27 and in verse 45. The text says, Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. The synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let me pause for just a moment and explain that word. Synoptic. S-Y-N, the prefix, means the same. Optics. Eyeballs, view, the same view. That's the idea of the word synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all present the same view of the life of Christ. The synoptics are distinct from John's gospel. While there are many things that John talks about that the synoptics do, John takes an entirely different perspective. The arrangement of John's gospel is very different from that of the synoptics. So when I talk about the synoptics, I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three Gospels that view the life of Christ from the same perspective. The synoptics all agree on this event, that there was darkness that covered the land for three hours. Luke's Gospel adds that the sun was obscured. Well, as with all miracles, skeptics deny that this happened, and they attribute this darkness to a solar eclipse. Sadly, even Bible-believing people have tried to make this same argument that, that, well, if you go back and you look, there was actually in historical records a solar eclipse that happened on the very same day that Jesus died, and they've done this in an effort to defend what the Bible says. But in reality, what they have done is simply compromise its truth. This kind of darkness that the Gospels speak of was not the same kind of darkness that we know of from a solar eclipse. Do you remember five years ago in 2017 when we had the solar eclipse and we all got on Amazon and bought those ridiculous glasses so that we could stare at the sun, which is the one thing that our parents told us never do when you're outside? And we all bought these glasses and we all walked out on our decks and our porches at whatever time it was and we just did this. All right, and we're all staring at the sun, and we're all worried, did we get the right glasses or not? Because if we didn't, then our eyeballs are just going to melt out of our sockets. But I think we got the right ones. I mean, they've got that little thing that says made in China on it. Surely this is right. (laughs) Do you remember how long that lasted? How long did that solar eclipse last when the sun was completely covered? Do you remember how long it lasted? It lasted like a minute, a minute and a half maybe. It wasn't much. It wasn't a long event. The Gospels say that there was darkness on the land for three hours. This was not just some solar eclipse. Mark's Gospel says that Jesus was hung on the cross at the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. The third hour of the day. You may remember from Acts chapter 2 when the apostles were speaking in tongues and all of that crowd gathered around and there were some who were mocking who said, these men are just drunk. That's why they're talking like this. And you may remember Peter stood up and said, these men are not drunk for it is only the third hour of the day. This is going from the Jewish calendar where the day begins at 6 a.m. So the third hour of the day would be 9 o'clock in the morning. And so the three Gospels tell us about this darkness. That this darkness came over the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. That is from 12 noon until 3 p.m. There was total darkness over the land. There are other astronomical reasons to believe that this was not just a solar eclipse. But I'm not an astronomer. Neither are you. And this is not an astronomy lecture. So I'm not going to go into those other reasons. It is best for us to believe that this was a supernatural event. 
And one of the simplest reasons to believe that this was a supernatural darkness is because of other supernatural events that happened that day as well. But let's not leave this at the purely physical level. Let's not just leave this at physical darkness that overshadowed the land. We must go a little bit deeper than that and think about the spiritual significance of this darkness. You see, that physical darkness, I believe, paralleled the spiritual realities of the day's events. If there was ever a time when the darkness of evil prevailed upon the earth, this was it. If ever there was a time where humanity's depths of depravity were displayed, this was it. If ever a time where men in all of their sinister schemes plotted against an innocent man, a time when injustice ruled over justice, a time when hate triumphed over evil, when evil conquered goodness, this was it. Truly a dark time on this earth. And the sun's fading simply reinforced the spiritual reality that was happening before the very eyes of all present. What else happened when Jesus died? There was an earthquake. And the Bible says that rocks were split open in that moment. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, look with me. At verse 51, at the end of verse 51, it says that the earth shook and the rocks were split. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The Gospels tell us that Jesus had actually just died right before this happened. If you look at verse 50, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then the earth quaked and the rocks split open. In the moments after Jesus gave up his spirit and breathed, up, breathed his last, the earth was shaking and these rocks were open. And interestingly, only Matthew records this, this earthquake and the splitting of the rocks. The other synoptics do not. And Matthew doesn't say much about it. He really just tells us what happened. But do we think that this was coincidental? Do we think that this was random? No, just like that supernatural darkness that had come over the earth. This was a supernatural earthquake. These rocks were split open by the power and the voice of God. This is the single most important day in human history. And it just so happens that an earthquake took place and rocks split open and darkness? I don't think so. God clearly made this happen just like he did the earthquake. Or excuse me, the darkness. Here's the third thing that happened when Jesus died. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Look at verse 51, Matthew 27. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, these last two points I want to spend a little more time on. These take a little bit more time and thought to develop. I know what you're thinking. Ben, you're only 11 minutes into your sermon and you've already covered two of the four points. Wow, this is great. You could only be so lucky. Let's talk about this veil being torn in two. The synoptic gospels all mention this event. But they don't attach any significance to it. They just tell us that it happened. But the book of Hebrews provides the significance. So let's go there together. I'm going to chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And as you're turning there... Let me just remind you of what this veil was. First in the tabernacle and later in the temple that Solomon built, the veil was a large curtain that divided the two rooms in the tabernacle and in the temple, one from another. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 33, we are told that the first room in the tabernacle was called the holy place. And separating the holy place from the most holy place was this veil or this curtain. 
Understand that this veil was not some small curtain like we would use for a window covering. This was not something that you would go and buy at Bed Bath & Beyond to serve as a window drape. This was not a thin, sheer material. In fact, this material that was used was very thick and very heavy. This veil that was made was likely 45 to 60 feet in length, and it was 30 feet high. It It was made of a very thick, woven fabric. Jewish writings indicate that it took numerous priests to be able to handle this veil. Think about the care that those in the armed services go to when they handle our nation's flag. Two men can fold up that flag and do so with great pride and honor, but also with great precision. But it only takes two people to do it. Alan, is there a way, do they make, a, is it possible for just one, one person to do it? I don't know how that works. No. It's, is it always two people? Yeah, it's always two people. Okay. This veil, much larger in its size, much thicker and weightier than an American flag. The priests would take a large group of people to move this veil, to fold it and care for it as the tabernacle was moving about in the wilderness. And this thick, heavy veil was torn in two pieces. The text says from the top to the bottom. And many people have, have noticed that and said, what that tells us is this was God's doing and not man's. In the most holy place of the tabernacle and the temple was the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 9. Let's start reading in verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared... The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That's the first room of the tabernacle and the furnishings within it. And now verse 3. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense, or the censer, And the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Those are the furnishings and the arrangement of the tabernacle. Inside that most holy place was the presence of God. Not that God literally was completely contained inside the tent. That's not the idea. But God's presence in a symbolic kind of a way was believed to be among the people. And inside this most holy place where God's presence was, understand that not just anybody could go in there. In fact, only one person could go in there, the high priest of the nation. He was the only person authorized to go into the most holy place. But he couldn't just go whenever he wanted to. He was only allowed to go into the presence of God one day per year. One man, one time, every year. Look at verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, that's the most holy place, the high priest went alone once a year. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all 
was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. One man, one time, each year, was allowed to go into the most holy place and offer sacrifices before the presence of God. But what about everybody else? What if you weren't the high priest? What if you weren't a priest? What if you were just a member of the Jewish community, of the nation of Israel? What about you? Could you ever go into the presence of God? No. You were expressly forbidden to access the presence of God. The only way you could come into God's presence was to do so through the mediation of the high priest, and that only once a year. That veil that separated these two rooms in the tabernacle and in the temple. It was a restrictive veil. You don't go through that. It's not for you to go into the presence of God. But what happened when Jesus died? God tore that thick, heavy, woven fabric in two. What does that mean? It means there's no more restrictions. And the Hebrew writer makes this plain for us. Look at chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the most holy place, we, he says, Christians, have boldness and courage to go into the most holy place. Well, wait a minute. It wasn't that way before. Never throughout history have God's people just been able to go into the presence of God. Why is it that we as Christians can do it now? We have boldness to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil which is his flesh. When Christ came to earth, he came in a tent. He came in a body. And in his body, which he offered up for us as a sacrifice to God, he made it possible for us to go into, directly into the presence of God. And in verse 21, it says that we have a high priest over the house of God, which is Jesus Christ. So let us, verse 22 Draw near, which none of God's people, save the high priest, have ever been able to do before. But now all of us can draw near to the presence of God, because that veil has been taken away. The sacrifice of Christ has opened access to the presence of God. Not for one man, but for all men. Not once a year, but every day, every time we open our mouths and speak to God in prayer, we are going into his presence. Every time we come together and we worship God as his people, we are in his presence. He accepts our worship. He hears our prayers. He answers them. And that is only possible because of what Christ has done for us in his death. Now go with me to chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. What happened when Jesus died? That veil was torn. And access to God's presence was made available to all people who come to him through Christ. Now let's go back to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Here's the fourth thing that happened when Jesus died. Graves were opened and bodies were resurrected. But we've got to give some more careful examination of this fourth one. Look with me at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52. 
The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city, and they appeared to many. Only Matthew mentions this. And it leaves us with more questions than it does answers, perhaps. Who are these saints that were raised up? Who are these people? I don't know. Most of the commentators think they were Old Testament characters. God's faithful people from Old Testament times, men and women, who were so dedicated to him. Maybe that's right. I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. It just says that there were holy ones or saints who were raised up. But I want you to notice something that's very important about this. Notice in verse 53, it says that these who were coming out of the tombs, notice it says, after his resurrection. Don't miss that phrase. After Jesus' resurrection. This event is mentioned along with the others, but it did not take place at the same time as the others. You see that. These who came out of the tombs did not resurrect until after Jesus had resurrected. I've noticed that people either forget about this, that that this occurrence is even in the Bible at all, or maybe they think that it happened on the same day that Jesus died, just like the darkness and the earthquake and the veil being torn, because it's mentioned right here with those other events. In fact, there's even a song that we sing sometimes that makes this second error, placing these things together. Please don't throw stones at me, okay? Todd Anderson, I'm thinking about you especially. I know you love this song. The power of the cross. The third verse. Listen carefully to how it reads. Now the daylight flees. Darkness. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Earthquake. Curtain torn in two. The veil. Dead are raised to life. You see, it groups them in with these other events. Todd, don't get mad at me. I know you love that song. And I'm not saying it's an evil song. I'm just pointing out a chronological error within the song. And I don't want to make a big deal out of this. But I do simply use that to show you how a song, which makes that mistake in order, could contribute to our thinking in a mistaken way about the things that have happened. The song isn't wrong in mentioning dead being raised to life. It just puts it in the wrong order. So why was it mentioned here? Why is it mentioned here if if it happened three days later, after Jesus rose from the dead? And the only thing I can speculate about that is that it was yet another miraculous phenomena that took place surrounding Jesus' death. And so it was grouped together with others in that way. Why does this matter? Who cares what order it was done in? Well, the New Testament cares. And I'll show you. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It was important that Jesus be raised first and then these others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 20, Paul says that now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's the first fruits of those who have died. Matthew 27 uses that language. Those who have fallen asleep. Those saints, whoever they were, they died faithful to God. How will they be raised up? Christ must be raised first. 
Paul says. He's the first fruits. You can go back in the Old Testament and read about the idea of the first fruits. But the simple idea is that whenever the Jews brought in their harvest, the first portion of what they brought in belonged to God. And Jesus is called the first fruits of his followers. And so in verse 21, for since by man came death, by man, by another man is the idea, also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all will be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. You see, Jesus is leading the way for the rest of us to follow. He was raised first. And Paul will say in other books of the New Testament that because God raised him first, and showed his power through him, we come to have hope and confidence that God will raise us too. Because he did it for Christ first, he will also do it for us. And so these in Matthew 27 who were raised up, who walked into the city, boy, think about how strange that must have been. These raised up bodies of long dead people walking through the streets of Jerusalem, But it was after Jesus' resurrection. His resurrection gives hope for our own. We'll go back to Matthew 27. Let's close with this idea. What happened when Jesus died? Darkness, earthquake, rocks splitting into the veil being rent asunder. What do all these things mean? We don't have to wonder about that. We know exactly what we should take away from these things because we have the testimony of someone who saw them. Matthew 27, verse 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. How do I know these things were supernatural things? Look at the conclusion of the centurion. Something profound happened that day. And the centurion grasped the significance. What a profession this was. This pagan soldier expressed the greatest truth that could ever come from the lips of a man. Truly, he is the son of God. He made the same profession. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. It didn't occur to me until just a few days ago. He made the exact same profession of faith that Peter made in Matthew 16, 16. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The centurion said the exact same thing. And I have to wonder, is there someone here today who's ready to make that same profession? That Jesus Christ is the son of God who died for your sins, who was raised to give you hope and life eternal. And if there's someone here this morning who is ready to make that profession, we want you to come forward and do that right now as we stand and sing together.